And welcome to episode 217 of the Actual Astronomy Podcast. Today we're talking about cats. Yeah. I'm Chris and joining me is Shane. We are amateur astronomers who love looking up the night sky and this podcast is for anyone else who likes going out under the stars. So last week we chatted about refractors and uh, maybe we've got a little series going on here. But just before we uh, start talking about cats, you and I were uh, just having a, a quick non-cat chat about uh, sort of some vintage uh, lenses that we'd seen uh, coming through, uh, there's some, every once in a while, we see like a little Zeiss lens, like a 50 or an 80 millimeter. And, and you were mentioning that uh, you would consider getting one of these at some point in time. Yeah. So on Astromart, there were two, uh, looks like they're still there. Yep. Um, two Zeiss, uh, lens cell objectives. Um, uh, looks like the price was lowered on this one. So one is the 50 millimeter by 540. Um, it looks like, I think this came out in like the sixties. Um, I think originally this person was asking around four or $500 us. It's now down to 300. Um, but you still need like the optical tube assembly and you, you like, you need everything else for the telescope. Uh, this mm-hmm. is just the lens and then the lens cell. Mm-hmm. Um, I used to have one of these, uh, and I had it in the OTA, like in a telescope and it is an outstanding uh, achromatic telescope, especially for 50 millimeters. I had some incredible views of the moon, uh, through that little telescope and, um, you know, some other larger open clusters and asterisms. Um, it's, it's really quite nice. Sorry. Which um, one was it that you had the 50 by 540? Oh, okay. Yeah. I sold that when I purchased the Borg 50 FL, um, because mm-hmm. I don't think I need three 50 millimeter telescopes. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I know. So I sold mine. I'd have to go back and double check, but so mine was the lens cell, the tube, uh, a helical focuser and rings and a dovetail, I think. So basically everything you needed to, to use this. Mm. And I think I sold mine for like 250 Canadian, something like that. Okay. Um, it was probably worth a little bit more, but I just wanted to, to sell it. So that is still out there. Um, and I can vouch for the quality of those, uh, those Zeiss acromats, uh, as quite outstanding. Mm-hmm. Um, the other one is a Zeiss Jenna E, uh, 80 millimeter, uh, aperture by 1200 millimeter focal length lens. It's again, it's an acromat. Um, I've never looked through one of these ones, but I've been intrigued by these because, um, I just think that like, as far as acromats go, that 80 millimeter uh, by 1200 millimeter focal length is sort of that uh, you you and I talk about sweet spot for telescopes in terms of like size, portability, quality, aperture, all that stuff. As far as acromats go, this one is like any bigger than this. And it really becomes a beast. Um, Mm -hmm. Even 1200 millimeter focal length is incredibly large and it's hard to visualize until you have it in your hands. Um, my Tasco 10 TE is a 76.2 millimeter aperture with a 1200 millimeter focal length. This thing is huge. Like it blows my mind how big 1200 millimeters is. Yeah. Um, but I believe just based on my uh, experience with that 50 millimeter Zeiss Acromat, that this 80 millimeter Zeiss Acromat would just be outstanding. I, I think it would be an incredible telescope. Um, now this, this is available on Astromart right now for the lens cell, same as the 50 millimeter, you'd have to get a tube to put this thing in and a focuser and on and on and on. Um, but if you, you know, if you have the uh, desire to do that and the ability to do that, um, I think this would just be a wonderful telescope. Hmm. Yeah, that's, the, it's a pretty neat, uh, setup there. You know, I often, uh, have thought about getting one of those and then getting like Moonraker or somebody to put it into yeah. it too. But at some point I'm going to, I'm going to get something, uh, just uh, I'm waiting for the right set to come and, uh, waiting for, for myself to have an observatory and uh, at least to be able to set it up so that I have kind of like that big refractor that looks um, a certain way and, uh, you know, can, can be used, uh, just in that sort of traditional way and, and, uh, just really have, have some fun with it so that when you kind of open it up and somebody steps in for the first time, like, even though it's like maybe just an 80 millimeter instrument, they're just like, Whoa, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) 
Yeah, the I, I I would love to look through one of these ice acromats. Like w- when you're talking about focal lengths this long, um, you have to get rid, especially like with a Zeiss made lens, you, you need to shed like any negative stereotypes you have about acromats because they're probably non-existent with this one, you know, in terms mm-hmm. of like poor color, not able to take magnification, whatever it might be, this will probably eliminate all of that stuff. Um and like the, uh, the acromats that I've looked through, like I've looked through quite a few and I've owned quite a few of these vintage ones, not, not all Zeiss. Like the only Zeiss I've had is that 50 millimeter. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, I guess my telemeter too. I forgot about that. The 63 millimeter, they're all outstanding when, when the lenses are made by, you know, a, a good optical manufacturing process. Um, so Zeiss is renowned. The Royal Astro Optical RAO stuff from the 60s, 50s and 60s is really, really good. Like my my Tasco 10TE is an outstanding telescope. Um, it, it's one of those ones that if under a, you know, a dark sky, you know, if you didn't know it was a Tasco and didn't come with some preconceived, uh, you know, stereotypes about it, you would probably be blown away by just looking through it and, and seeing what you see. Um, so, yeah, uh, I... I think this would be a super cool project to turn this Zeiss 80 1200 into a, a, you know, a functioning telescope. And like you said, Chris, if you, if you, um, got the Moonraker, uh, you know, sort of customization or, or whatever they do, it would just be stunning. Uh, I, I can't even imagine. Yeah. Yeah. I think it would be, uh, it would be super, super cool. Yeah. I, I have a few, I have a few, uh, lenses on my watch list. Uh, these aren't, those lenses. And, uh, yeah, one day I'd like to get that configuration. Uh, like, like I said, I think it'd be just, just super, super cool to have it set up. And then, you know, someone walks in and they're like, Oh, what is that? You know, it looks like that's just ridiculous. And then you're like, it's a Zeiss, you know, it, it just kind of takes it to that next level. Once uh, people start comprehending, uh, you know, what, what they're looking at there, but, uh, hey, we're going to talk cats today. Yeah. Yeah. Enough of refractors. Uh, yeah. Who needs those things? Stupid glass that's unobstructed and gives pure views. <laughs> <laughs> who needs it? Not who me. Need- no, yeah. actually I do, but. Do you ever uh, own any? Uh, so what is it? What is a cat had the optric or as we call them a cat telescope anyway? What, what are we what are we talking about when we talk about a, a, a cat telescope? Yeah, so so I think maybe uh, the best way to relate these to everybody listening or the most common uh, telescope in this category would be the Smith Cassegrain uh, SCT. Uh, Celestron makes them and they've made them for a long, long time. Mead makes them. There, there's a number of manufacturers that, that make Cassegrains, uh, but basically, uh, is it a catadioptric or I, anyway, a cat telescope is a telescope that has a lens on the front, a primary mirror, and then a secondary, uh, mirror that does some correction. And, and they all, there, there's these three elements that all work together. They bounce the light back to a diagonal and then into the eyepiece. Um, they're often very compact looking telescopes mm-hmm. and um, they're quite popular. Um, they, they, you know, I, I've looked through many, I've owned a few and, um, the, you know, certainly in our club here in uh, Regina, Saskatchewan, I think the Cassegrains are pretty high in terms of population, you know, who yeah, has them. I think so. Like I'd say probably at least 50% with like the remaining 49% being like reflectors. Um, yeah. And then the 1% being me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm, I was kind of surprised when I came here um, because uh, typically uh, lots of folks have the, the reflectors uh, set up in a variety of different configs. The, the odd person will have a, uh, have a Schmidt Cassegrain and then uh, usually about uh, a few more people than the Cassegrains would have refractors. So um, yeah, it's, it's a little bit surprising. Um, let's see. So how many, and, and what have you owned for, uh, for compound? Now I call them a compound telescope. Often they're called cats um, or cat had the optics. Um, but uh, the reason why is, is that, uh, you know, they, they, I guess they're, you know, refracting and reflecting the light both. So it's a bit of a com- compounding system uh, in there. So what, what ones have you owned, Shane? What, what's your been, uh, what's your experience been with all this? 
Um, I've owned, I'm trying to think here. So two of the same telescope, essentially, um, I've had, um, 127 millimeter Skywatch. Uh, I think they're F12 Maksutovs, mm -hmm. uh, which fall into this, uh, cat category. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I've had them at two different points in time. Um, the first time it was packaged with a, um, a Celestron SE8 mount. Um, so mm -hmm. this is, a an alt as mount, but it has go-to and tracking on it. And, um, I really just wanted the mount, but it was the telescope sort of came with the package deal. Uh, so I received that. And when I did, I thought it would be ideal for my observatory that I had at the time in the backyard, I would just leave that mount and that telescope, uh, out there. And I did that for quite a while. And, um, it was a fun telescope for the most part. Uh, you know, it, it rode very well on that mount. It, uh, you know, one of the, one of the big benefits, I think of this type of telescope is the compactness of it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, this thing was an F 12, but I think it was probably, I'm just guesstimating now 20 inches long was the OTA. Yeah. Like it, it's quite small. Yeah. Um, so because there's not much of a moment arm, uh, it's more mountable than say, uh, a refractor that was 127 millimeters. Yeah. Um, so anyway, it, 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 it was pretty cool. One of the memorable observations with that telescope is that, um, one night I was out, so I would open the dome when I was observing way before I actually wanted to observe just to get the hot air out and get the telescope, uh, acclimatizing to the outdoor temperatures. Um, but the, the benefit of the observatory and a go-to mount and all of this stuff was that I flicked on the mount, told it to go to Saturn. And I like, this was way before sunset. I shouldn't say way before getting close to sunset. So certainly no stars visible. Um, I just, uh, turned on the Mount. I said, go to Saturn. It moved around. It was pointed at a point in the sky where there were no, you know, dots of light. And I looked through the eyepiece and there was Saturn <laughs> with the, you know, a blue sky background. It was very, it was very neat. It was almost surreal. Um, so that was kind of a memorable observation, but anyway, this thing didn't last with me, uh, simply because, the, um, the cool down time was not very good. It took a long time. And for my purposes of leaving it out in the observatory, um, on a 25 degree day Celsius, uh, 25 degrees Celsius day in the summertime, which is, you know, fairly warm Yep. inside my observatory, it would get up to like 40 degrees Celsius. Uh, and this was the sky pod that I had. It was gray. Um, so it would get very warm in there while I was at work. And to go from 40 degrees to, you know, an evening temperature of say 10 to 20 degrees, it would take a long time for this telescope to try to catch up. And, um, I just felt like it never really did. Um, and then, uh, the, the other thing too, and, and I don't know, I don't think collimation was quite right with this one. It didn't handle high magnification all that well, or at least as well as I wanted. Yeah. So that was a little bit of an issue. Um, and, and that might be one of the primary things that maybe we'll talk, well, not primary thing we'll talk about, but like a, a big consideration for these telescopes is, is just like a reflector, like collimation is important. And mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't think they need to be collimated quite as often as reflectors, but I, I do think some people don't even really look at collimation with these Cassegrains or, or compound telescopes. And you really need to be able to do that to ensure you're getting the right view because there's so many, it's a complex system, you know, with the mm -hmm. lens, a primary mirror, a secondary mirror, um, or a corrector, I guess it's not really a secondary, um, you have all of these things in play. And if they're not all aligned properly, um, you know, it'll impact your ability to use high magnifications or, or get some really nice views. Um, but anyway, I ended up with another 127 millimeter later in life. Um, and it was, again, it was sort of a part of a package of something else I was after and I didn't, uh, I didn't keep it for very long, but, uh, I know, I think you still own one. Um, and yeah. you've, you've definitely, uh, had some experience with these things too. So, uh, what do you have, Chris? Yeah. I just, just wanted to say that the, uh, the Skywatcher 127, uh, Mac, uh, F12 comes with the AZ GTI, uh, E, uh, oh. which is, yeah. So it, I think that's a, a interesting package. And I think it's strange that they put that one with the, 
um, E, which is the manual option, and the and the uh, the refractor goes with the one that doesn't have the manual option uh, with those easy mounts. But anyway, um, and uh, our friend Randall, he he has one of these one two sevens, and he did that trick with the re- reflectix, reflectorix, or that right. that reflecting material. Yeah. Um, I forget what the name of that material is exactly, but it's like the silvery material and uh, you can go on cloudy nights and, and look for ways to cool down or, or, or get better images through your uh, little uh, schmick And uh, yeah, that's, that's what he did. And he said it was amazing, like world of difference. So um, what people are doing now is they're wrapping the telescopes in this reflective material. And it uh, serves, I guess, a couple purposes. One is that, the telescope, uh, you know, in the daytime doesn't heat up as much. And then when you take it out at night, um, it creates like a stabilizing, um, feature for, for that, uh, for, for the air in, in that uh, telescope. So, uh, pretty interesting stuff. Uh, I've got the six inch, uh, it's not an Intis, it's a Santal, um, Max Sutoff Cassegrain. And Santal uh, was a small offshoot of Intis or Intis Micro, which was a, a Russian uh, producer of uh, 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 Maksudov telescopes, including um, these ones, like just sort of the Maksudov Cassegrains, as well as the uh, the Mac uh, or the Schmidt Newtonians, uh, not Schmidt Newtonians, the Maksudov Newtonians. Um, so anyway, I have this Santel six, uh, it's called an MK 67, uh, anyway, and, uh, it's really, really nice telescope and it's rated as one of the best, I think, uh, Max Sudovs. And I got it for a really cheap price cause it had a broken focuser and my friend Tim fixed the focuser, um, in like 30 seconds. So I got a telescope really inexpensively and what did I do? I bought it and it was in Florida. And the person I bought it from had bought it from, I used to be called ITE Telescope Exchange, and they used to sell these instruments. And just before they went into business, I'd purchased this used from a guy that lived in the next city over and bought one from them and was looking to sell it. So it wasn't really a well-used telescope. It didn't have a lot of miles on it. And the guy said that he'd be happy to drop it off um, at IT. And so ITE um, did some work to it. Um, to, to bring it right up. Like they took it apart, cleaned the whole thing, serviced it, blah, 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 and then sent it to me. And it was basically like a brand new telescope. And I think I paid $500 Canadian for it, including shipping. So it's a pretty good oh, deal wow. for, yeah, pretty good deal for like one of the best six inch Max Sudovs ever made. So I, I won't sell it. It's just like, I always wanted that telescope and I have it. I used to use it a lot in Ontario, mm-hmm. but I haven't used it here just because of our cool down times and uh, getting the five inch refractor as well kind of puts a damper on using a six inch uh, compound telescope. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. Um, and you kind of have some duplication there and you know, it, <laughs> I guess maybe other than some high magnifications, it, it may not do much more or any more than what your current five inch is doing. Yeah. Well, in fact, I think it'd be more of a comparison and, and I'd like to do this someday. Like I'd like to get it mounted up. And, uh, just to be, or be able to mount it a little bit easier and, uh, and do a comparison. I think really the four inch tack would be the one to compare it with, because like in my experience, it's that central obstruction, um, subtracted from the aperture of the, of the telescope, which gives you, um, the refractor comparison. And I think it's got, um, just about a two inch, um, secondary obstruction in it. So six minus two equals four. So I think that's really the comparison might be a little bit better than that, but the tax seems like it's a little bit better than a regular four inch anyway. So, mm-hmm. yeah, cool. Uh, I've looked through lots though, lots yeah. of mead eight and 10 inch and lots yeah. of Celestron eight, nine and a quarter. Plus uh, I've looked through a few of the 14s. Yeah, I've looked through uh, C6s, a number of those, and those ones always impress me, uh, I think just because of how small they are. Yeah. Um, so that's a cast agree. Most of the cast, yeah, most, uh, I've looked through a six inch Skywatcher Mac, um, or was it even a seven inch? It might've been like their, uh, do they make a 180? Yeah, they do actually. Yeah. It's, it's pretty popular. I've looked through one of those as well and they're nice. Yeah. 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 It was really good. Uh, looked at the moon with that one time. 
Um, but yeah, I've looked through C8s, uh, Celestron nine and a quarters, C11s, uh, C14s, uh, Mead, uh, eight inch Cassegrains. Um, that might be about it. Yeah, they're, they're, they've all provided some really nice views. In fact, the C, I think it was the C11 that I was looking through of a friend's um, incredible views of uh, like the Dumbbell Nebula. Um, Jupiter that night was wild. Um, it, it really impressed me. It was a nice telescope. Yeah. So there's, there's sort of like four main types, uh, that, that we think about at least, you know, kind of taking the amateur perspective here. And, uh, one is like the main one, uh, which is the Schmidt Cassegrain, which is, uh, kind of like ubiquitous in amateur circles, like you were saying, because, uh, smallish, somewhat compact and, uh, you know, uh, widely available for somewhat inexpensive pricing. And, um, a lot of people will use them for, um, for imaging purposes and, and for astrophotography. I think they used to be a little bit more popular for astrophotography. I think the refractors have sort of, uh, retaken the lead because, uh, people are able to squeeze a little bit more out of the small apertures of, of the refractor. Uh, uh but I, I could stand correct on that cause I'm not an imager. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I think you might be right. And, um, yeah, I'm not much of an imager, uh, myself, so I, I don't, I don't dabble enough to really know, but, um, there's definitely a lot of people that do like to image with caster greens. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think you need reducers and there's a lot of, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, but I've seen some nice images from them. Yeah. Then we each have the max, just the straight, uh, sort of max Sutovs, like the one that I'm talking about, which is really, I guess, like a max Sutov caster green. Um, but typically we just call that, that a, a Mac. And then we have uh, Mac Newtonians, which mm-hmm. is, uh, you know, we'll get into that here in a minute, but um, puts a corrector plate on the front. And then uh, otherwise it works uh, pretty much just like a Newtonian. And then Schmidt Newtonians, which uh, is kind of the same thing, puts a corrector plate on the front. And then um, other than that, it works more or less just like a, like a regular Newtonian. These corrector plates um, correct for uh, aberrations. So uh, yeah, it's kind of kind of how they work, but with, with all these, you know, there's kind of like, uh, I'm just going to go over this really quick. We'll probably touch on this, uh, briefly. I've put a lot of notes in here, but I don't know how much of this we're going to cover. Um, but when I, when I think about like the Schmidt Cassegrains, what we got is we got the, the very thin kind of corrector plate. And then right in the center is like a plastic disc. And on the other side of that disc is, um, another mirror and so what happens is the light it passes through that meniscus plate on the front. So it's not just an opening, it's an opening, but the opening is filled with a glass plate, which has like um, something in the middle of it. And then that light goes through the telescope. And then at the other end of the tube, the very short tube, there's a mirror, hits the mirror, bounces back towards the um meniscus lens towards the opening and then, but it's focused a bit. And so it lands, uh, in the center hits that, um, secondary mirror or tertiary optical surface. And then that gets thrown back again, 180 degrees and goes through a hole in the bottom of the mirror and then comes out. And typically people have mirror diagonals, um, hits that mirror diagonal and then comes out the eyepiece. So it's kind of, the lights kind of getting bounced and back and forth. Uh, I guess one, goes through two comes back up and then three comes down and then four hits the um, mirror and then into the person's uh, eyepiece. And then I, and that's, that's basically how they work. eh? Yeah. 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 It bounces around quite a bit in that tube and that's how you end up with such a, like a short tube, but such a long focal length because the focal length is representative of how the, the, the distance that the light travels in your optical system before it reaches your eye, essentially. Yeah. And, uh, so the Schmidt Cassegrains, they, they all work, uh, basically, uh, the same way. And it's, uh, just like we were saying, a combination of, uh, of a reflector and, uh, a corrector plate and they're, they're compact, um, and they use uh, spherical surfaces. So I put a little bit of the history of these and I noticed this astronomer and lens designer, James Baker first proposed the Cassegrain design for the uh, Bernard Schmidt uh, camera in 1940. And the first one was made at Mount Wilson. And I was actually uh, looking online yesterday and I saw there was, uh, I guess somebody 
must be making these. And I see a lot of these older designs coming up again. Like we see some of these cast of grains being produced by Gwen Chang and some of the other um, big production houses. Um, but I did see a, an actual Baker design, um, which I assume is, um, you know, ba- basically just a Schmidt camera that, uh, that one of these optical houses had produced at least sometime in the past, uh, you know, a couple decades. So th- these are around, you can find them. Hmm. I've uh, I've never really looked too much into the like the old history of these things or or what you know is still out there. So that's interesting. Yeah. So it was in the Mount Wilson Optical Shop that they made the first uh, Schmidt Cassegrain, and that was during uh, the Second World War. Um, and what they were doing is they were researching optical design, uh, optical designs for military purposes. And so, uh, as in the Schmidt camera, this design uh, had spherical uh, primary mirror and a Schmidt corrector plate to correct for the spherical aberrations. Um, and then it had a convex secondary mirror, uh, which acted as a field flattener and uh, relayed that image through, through the perforated or, or bottom primary mirror. Um, and then it would come out there and, and hit, uh, hit the diagonal or you know, photographic film, I guess, at the, at the time. Um, the, the Schmidt cast grain, like we were saying, it's uh, very popular to amateur astronomers because, um, yeah, it combines that long focal length into a uh, really small tube. And that can enable you to hit some high powers on planets and do some astrophotography. You can put focal reducers in there to do wide field astrophotography, uh, all in a compact design, pretty flexible uh, systems. Uh, anyway, pretty, pretty neat systems, eh? Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I, I think that there's certainly uh, like an application for them. Um, even once in a while, uh, recently, I've thought about getting like a eight to 11 inch Cassegrain just because you get so much aperture and such a small form factor. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, uh, if you listen to the last episode, you know, I'm on a different path right now. <laughs> Yeah, and the uh, these consumer versions, like these ones that you can just buy uh, via online or in a store or whatever, uh, they work by moving the primary mirror up and down the tube rather than um, like the traditional eye eyepiece in a focuser. Although, like I should say, this is that you can get aftermarket like regular focusers to stick on them, like from like uh, Moonlight or Feather Touch or Better or other companies uh, do make these, but the sort of uh, out of the box, off the shelf design yeah, works such that the mirror kind of moves up and down the tube uh, a little bit uh, to help you uh, achieve focus. Um, and because that means that there's small changes in the position of the mirror, um, you know, as it's moving up and down the tube and the mirror is not permanently fixed in place. And uh, what this can, can cause is what we call uh, image shift. And for those that uh, th- that have never looked through a, a Schmidt cast screen before, maybe you're thinking about getting one. Um, it is kind of a strange thing. And what, what happens is that the mirror can like kind of, they call it like a mirror flop and the mirror can kind of flop around a little bit inside the, the optical tube and uh, uh, can be uh, super annoying. So they've tried to uh, make this better over time by introducing certain mirror locks and other things. Um, and yeah, I think for sure, like if, if I had a Schmidt cast screen, I would just uh, get it well positioned, um, get things working properly and then um, align it. And then, uh, you know, as part of my system, I would also have like a feather touch focuser or uh, just a regular aftermarket focuser on the end. So I'm not going to get into that business of, of the mirror flop because uh, in the times that I've used them, I, I have found that to be uh, quite annoying myself. I don't know about you, Shane. Yeah, I don't know that like that might have been some of my issues with the high magnification not working so well with my cat or with my Mac that I had. I'm I'm not 100% sure, but I certainly know it drives um, uh, imagers crazy. Um, you know, they when you're imaging it's all about focus and when you have a little bit of this mirror flop, you know, you you probably did achieve focus, but then when this mirror flop uh hits you then um you're no longer focused and you won't be happy with your images. Yeah. So, and I guess, and we'll talk a little bit more about these uh, dip derivative designs in the Mac Sudoff, but um, mine uh, has the external focuser, so there's no mirror adjustment. The mirror is, mm. is solidly fixed in place. And honestly, I had it aligned and shipped from Florida and it landed. We star tested it and we never touched it. I, I think we decided that maybe we could have tweaked it a little bit, but we, we thought that that any tweaking we did might do more harm than good because it was like 99% of the way there. So we never touched it. Um, 
So the Maxudov design, uh, these are also uh, cat hadioptric uh, telescope design systems. And the way they work is they combine a spherical mirror with a weakly negative meniscus lens. Um, and so what it's doing there is it's leveraging having uh, both surfaces um, as spherical surfaces or, or one spherical one, just uh, slightly negative uh, spherical surface. And that negative uh, lens um, is, is a full aperture um, meniscus. And so uh, with mine and, and the, the optics of mine were very good. Um, I think what I read is the way that they um, designed them at Santel um, was that they ground the meniscus against the primary. So they made them as an optical set. So you weren't just kind of getting a, a mix and match of lenses and mirrors and blah, blah, blah. They were actually all like handmade and produced together. Um, to a reasonably high standard. And uh, certainly I, I can attest that, uh, that that worked pretty well. So you're not getting um, a lens, a meniscus lens that was ground um, just sort of in isolation with a mirror that was ground in isolation somewhere else. It's actually a matched pair. And they said that that works to cancel out some of the, or, or all of the aberrations basically that you might get from, uh, from, from having the, this type of system. So I thought it worked well. All right. Um, let's see. Yeah. So the design, it corrects for uh, off-axis aberrations such as coma and also uh, helps to correct any chromatic aberration, which I never noticed in, in my system. Uh, patented by a guy named uh, Dmitry uh, Maksudov. And Maksudov based his design um, on the idea that's, that's behind the Schmidt camera, um, which uses a spherical um uh, lenses and mirrors, uh, as well to, to, uh, to perform its operation. Um, and Maxudos have been sold on the amateur market since, uh, the 1950s. So, uh, this, uh, Dimitri Maxudov design, he says, uh, that he thought of it when he was, uh, on a train in the 1930s, uh, but he didn't come back to it, um, until after seeing the, uh, the more complex, uh, Schmidt, uh, Schmidt camera designs that were starting to come out from Mount Wilson in, in the 1940s. So, uh, he, he claims it's a unique, uh, idea, but, um, kind of sounds like maybe it's a little bit of a combination of, uh, had, had thought up this idea and then, um, maybe there was a few challenges with it. And then when he saw, uh, a similar, but different system, he was able to, um, kind of incorporate some of those changes. So, so who knows what the real story is, but certainly the Max Sudovs, I feel work uh, pretty darn, uh, good. So Shane, we get a whole pile of these Max Sudovs though. So the one thing that, that anybody's going to notice right away when they're looking at these is although not all Schmidt Casa grains are made the same. I've looked at a number of different ones from a number of different manufacturers and they all seem to work and look pretty much the same. Is, is that your experience as well? Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with that. Um, there's not, there's not a ton of variation. I, I think the variation for the most part is actually in the electronics and the mount uh, that usually comes with them. Um, you know, do you prefer the Mead style or the Celestron or the Ioptron or whatever manufacturer yeah. you're looking at? Uh, that that's usually the biggest part of it because you know, like a refractor, most of the time you're buying just the refractor, but mm -hmm. most of the time with the Cassegrain, it seems like you're buying like the mount comes with it, uh, like it's sort of uh, everything you need in a box uh, to yep. go out observing. Um, so yeah, for the most part, I, I, I think that they're all, uh, quite similar. Um, the, uh, even, even the focus air, uh, you know, on them is, is often pretty common too. you know, just the, the little knob that you turn, it's, it's a little different than what you're used to with like a refractor or a reflector. Yeah. I guess the one thing I should have mentioned, I should have put in the notes is that Cassegrain's like a straight Cassegrain. Um, we're going to refer to as a reflector. And although that is a compound telescope, um, we're not including it in this because we're just including the ones that have the uh, meniscus lenses. So I thought maybe when we talk about reflectors, uh, we can talk about those as well, because I believe they're more categorized as, uh, as in that reflector realm versus in, like in the Schmick uh, realm, which is, which is kind of what we're looking at here today. Yeah, good point. I I often inaccurately call Schmidt Cassegrains just Cassegrains to make yeah. it go simpler, but but there is a difference, and and I should be use, I should be saying Schmidt Cassegrain. 
Yeah, it's not, it's not a big deal. And, and it wouldn't be if the past 10 years didn't happen because in the past 10 years, we've seen um, sort of a resurgence in those cancer grains. And there's a big part of me that's kind of interested maybe to try to get one of those because um, those are beautiful systems and they don't have the meniscus at the lens, which means we don't have to fight um, a bottled up uh, hot optical tube. Um, but anyway, uh, maybe we'll get into that when we talk about uh, reflectors in a future podcast. Yeah. Um, but one of the things with the Max Sutovs, though, is that, and this is a little bit confusing, I think, for people that are just getting into this stuff, is that um, it seems like there's the mass produced ones and they're a certain design. There's the um, sort of uh, like Questar ones and they're of a slightly different design. There's the Russian ones that are a slightly different design. So there's a lot of different designs. And I really didn't know why uh, this was until we were making up the notes or until I was making up the notes for the podcast. And yesterday I kind of stumbled across this and it's sort of a bit of a reference. And probably if someone was just reading through, they probably wouldn't even care about this, but I was kind of just doing some digging, reading some papers online. And what happened was that during uh, World War II, um, there was a lot of secrecy and there were independent entities, I guess is the best way to put it, um, coming up with um, with a similar design to use for military purposes. And they and, and instead of like now where maybe somebody's working on a design and then there's more collaboration and then it gets flushed out and you have really just sort of one more or less um, similar system uh, as the output. Here we have a lot of perhaps different countries like, you know, perhaps some in Russia, perhaps some, um, in, you know, in, in the States and different places all kind of working to uh, accomplish a similar goal of being able to take um, high power photographs for military purposes or photograph um, uh, perhaps satellites or planes or that sort of thing. Um, and, and as a result, you got a whole bunch of different um, systems. So for example, one of the ones uh, that's most famous is the Questar, which is a three and a half inch or 90 millimeter um, instrument that was made in the 1950s, 1954, I think is when they released it. And they also made a seven inch, but uh, the, the three and a half is sort of this, this really famous, beautiful, very expensive, high performance, small kind of tabletop instrument. Um, and it has a meniscus and it has the mirror in the bottom. Um, but what they do, from what I understand, is they actually polish up and silver um, a piece on the back of the meniscus as their, um, I guess, the third optical surface. And so the light comes in through the meniscus, hits the primary mirror and comes up uh, and focuses on that, uh, that tertiary or secondary mirror. It's a tertiary optical surface, um, but it's all sort of part of that meniscus lens itself. And then we have manufacturers like, uh, you know, like Intes, uh, Intes Micro, Lomo, um, uh, Orion, Telescope Engineering Companies and others. And what they have done is they've created more of a design like mine is of this design. I think it's called like a Gregorian design. And it places like a plastic disc in the center of that meniscus. And that holds that um, third um, uh, mirror. And that's, that's what, uh, what that plastic plastic disc is doing. So that when the light comes through the meniscus hits the primary, it comes up and it's hitting a mirror that's held by this little plastic, um, disc. And then there's, there's a combination of that from the others. Some of them, what they've done is instead of polishing like a piece of the back of the disc, they've just taken a mirror and glued it to the back of the disc. And that's, that was made famous by the Mead ETX design. And I think some of the Cintascopes and Skywatcher scopes have used this design as well. And I believe that's more like what, what they're calling like a RUMAC design, because um, it has to be a design a certain way that's slightly different than the others. But the risk in that one, Shane, I don't know if you, you're reading this as well, the Mead uh, ETX line, um, which started with a 90 millimeter, and I think they had a hundred and a, and a five inch as well. Um, they were really popular, but after a number of years, the glue started letting go and people's, um, 
uh, third uh, optical element was actually crashing down onto the second one. <laughs> so that may, may not be a, a good long-term uh, solution for the design. I don't know if you ever heard about any of that, but uh, I certainly did from owners of the Mead ETXs. Yeah, I've only known one person that's owned one. Um, I don't recall him ever mentioning anything like that, but uh, uh, that was a while ago too. So I don't even know if he still has the telescope. Yeah, from what I've been able to read and just like in my own experience with mine, which I, I think is the Gregorian design, I, I think that's it. I could have this mixed up, but I, I didn't really go down that rabbit hole and prepare the notes. Um, I think having that plastic holder is a good option because unlike with the other designs, it allows you to kind of get in there and fiddle with it and actually make the optical alignment. And I think that uh, that's really important, you know, like you were saying, because of different things, like especially if you have mirror shift in some of the designs. And that's one of the other things is that in some of the designs, particularly the Russian designs, and I think maybe the telescope engineering designs, maybe uh, at least one of them uh, has an external focuser, whereas some of them have an internal focuser um, where it's where it's moving that mirror as well. But it's it's tweaked from the uh, Schmidt Cassegrain design. But I really like the external focuser uh, as, as a default option on these. I think it's a pretty slick system. Yeah. Yeah. That is a good way to go. And I think like, I, I remember one of, uh, one of the observing buddies that I had, uh, or that had a, um, I think it was a C11. I think he put on, um, oh, some sort of aftermarket focuser. It wasn't, uh, I think it was a moonlight mm. focuser, um, that just, and it looked super easy. Like it just, uh, you, you unscrewed the visual back off of the Cassegrain and, yep. and you put, you screwed on the focuser and you were nice. done. It was very easy. Very good. And we have um, another set of designs. We, we haven't, we're not going to really drill down in these too much. Um, I've never looked through one of these, but it's the Schmidt Newtonian. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a few different versions that have come out over the years. Um, the most popular ones uh, were by Mead. And they made a six, an eight, and a 10 inch. There was a six inch F5. There was an eight inch F4 and a 10 inch F4. I think that was the line. And uh, they were pretty heavy units. And I think they were designed mostly for uh, like astro imagers. And this was, I think this was like in the 90s, because I remember when these things came out. And uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of people say they were pretty good and they were pretty inexpensive, I think, for for what you were getting, pretty good quality. And uh, yeah, did you ever, I've never looked through one of those units. Have you? No, no, I haven't. Is it, isn't this the design you're sort of intrigued by, particularly the, the Takahashi made uh, Mac Newtonians? Yeah. So there was a, uh, let's see, there was a Vixen that I'm interested in and there was a uh, Celestron um, version as well of okay. a, of a five and a half uh, inch. Now the Celestron is, called the the comic country and these come up for sale uh quite frequently and it's it's something that i'm definitely going to own at some point in time and they're just these little uh five and a half inch telescopes they've got a corrector plate and then uh, other than that it works more or less just like a newtonian um and and they have you know reasonably good uh, quality optics, but they're really wide field instruments and mm -hmm. the Schmidt Newtonians can operate uh, pretty fast. So these days, uh, what we typically do with a Newtonian is if, if you have anything than uh, about F5 or faster, what you do is you just get um, a coma corrector. They're made by TSO. Um, Teleview makes a really expensive one. And then I think there's, there's a couple others. Uh, Explorer Scientific makes sort of one that's in between um, the cost of, of those other two. And they all work pretty well. Um, different FUTs factors with them. The Teleview is really slick, um, works perfectly. Um, like Mike has one in his 12 inch F 4.9. And I always feel like it, it almost goes from feeling like you're looking through a 12 inch reflector to looking through a 12 inch refractor because it's a, a ridiculous uh, improvement on, on the image quality. It just really, really tightens everything up. Very, very, um, you know, highly recommended if, if somebody has a, has a reflector, but what these instruments do, and they were sort of put out a, a little bit before, though there was the Paracore one, but what, what they're doing is they're correcting the, uh, the Newtonian for um, coma by using uh, a Schmidt plate in the front. And that allows you to have a reasonably fast system um, 
and then you can just swap eye pieces in and out. But these days, typically, we're using the uh, the, the 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 different coma correctors made by the manufacturers uh, instead of uh, having these these large and unwieldy systems. Um, although, like I, I I see the the comic catchers come come up and go through really quick, and they they seem to get picked up very quickly um, by people that are that are using them for mostly night vision purposes. I I think anyway. Anyway, they're, they're kind of neat. Do you have any any intrigue uh, with with the Schmidt Newtonian design? I just think it's a neat design. I would love to look through one. Um, it doesn't register too high on my want list at all. But uh, you know, I might be convinced or or change my mind if I look through one and absolutely loved it. But uh, um, uh, you know, I, I guess I just need to to actually use one before I really make a judgment call. Yeah, I've never used one. I just like the idea of a five and a half inch uh, instrument that uh, the only way about four or five pounds are very light. And, uh, you know, I just like the idea of a really small, light, portable instrument. Uh, I, you know, I was thinking about getting one maybe as like a travel scope or something like that. But uh, yeah, but I don't know. I was also looking at some of the older Vixens um, in the 100 millimeter size range and uh, maybe messing around with one of those. They're F6. And they go super cheap, uh, less than hundred bucks Canadian. So I was thinking maybe of tracking a, a good quality, uh, one of those down, uh, as well for like sort of this ultimate reasonably sized, uh, travel scope. But, uh, anyway, so there's also Mac Newtonians and, uh, they work uh, pretty much the same as a Schmidt Newtonian. Um, they have a meniscus corrector lens though on the front. And so it's like a full corrector. And it reduces aberrations found in the regular Newtonian design. Uh, and they tend to have uh, optical performance that, that sometimes is rated as being excellent or, or perfect. So the, uh, the Schmidt Newtonians have a thinner meniscus. Some people will take them apart and say, oh, it's just like a piece of glass. And I think it's just correcting down to a certain uh, focal ratio. So it's taking like maybe like in the case of the uh, F4 instruments, it's making them work like an F5. Whereas the, um, the Mac newts is like a full correction. And so it's, uh, I don't know what you would say, maybe it's taken it to like an F8 or, or better, but it seems to be almost perfectly corrected. I've looked through some of the um, Mac newts and uh, they're amazing instruments, just mm -hmm. amazingly flat, um, beautifully corrected and uh, definitely can see the appeal but just unwieldy, like um, pretty popular in the six inch size. And those tend to be uh, pretty common in the used market, slightly less common as the seven inch F6, six inch F6, seven inch F6. They made a bunch of weird sub diameter ones of like five and six inch and F5 to F6 ratios. Um, the one I looked through was uh, uh, by Rudolph. He had, it was owned by Rudolph Dorner. And I think it's in the Canadian Telescope Museum now or you know, I think, I think that's where it is. And it's a beautiful Mac suit off, um, of the Newtonian design. And, uh, yeah, we were looking at M57 one night. I remember it's just like such a beautiful, beautiful image of it. Uh, I always wanted to have one of those telescopes, but I think it compares well to like a five inch, uh, Parker mat. So, so again, I'm kind of splitting hairs with some of my wants and desires. eh? Yeah. Well, there's so many options out there, which is part of the fascination of the hobby, but also some of the, at least for me, when I was getting into it, it was pretty confusing to try to understand, you know, what all of these designs meant. And, and then even more confusing, uh, for me was which one do I want, you know, like mm -hmm. which one suits me the best. Um, and, uh, you know, belonging to the astronomy club certainly helped because I was able to look through a lot of these different, uh, Schmidt Cassegrains and the odd Max Sutov. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the end result is they are really good performing telescopes and it, I, you know, again, it all depends what you're looking for. Yeah. And I think like you, I, I'm really attracted by, um, especially like the 11 inch size because, once you get to about an eight or nine inch reflector, um, you're into a pretty sizable instrument and getting it to do things like tracking, like if you want to sketch, and I know Mark Radici and I have chatted about this as well. Um, Mark Radici is from Refreshing Views. He's been on our show a couple of times and a uh, frequent correspond, correspondent uh, with, with, uh, with us. Um, and he's got the 11 inch. I know other people as well. And it's, it's nice to be able to get it on a target and then track it and then to be able to, to do your sketching. 
Um, that can be uh, not terrible with, with a regular reflector, but a bit of a challenge. And then as well, um, if you want to have a permanently mounted, like Mark has one in his uh, eight by 10 observatory, and that's a beautiful setup, uh, lots of room and works, you know, really nice. Um, doesn't have to uh, worry about having uh, really low walls. And in fact, that's how he went with it is he had a 14 inch daub, which he still has. And he originally had that in his observatory, but um, because the walls have to be so high and um, for other reasons, he, uh, he found that uh, he was wanting a different scope and settled on. He used uh, 11 inch Macassa grain and, and uh, kind of has never looked back and really loved that option. And by, by mounting it so in, in an observatory, you really get around that cool down time, which is sort of one of the largest uh, detractors. And then as well, like I know he does both visual and astro imaging and he's been able to, to sort of uh, dabble in, in both of his uh, astronomical pursuits uh, uh, you know, but by, by having that instrument in there. So yeah, I'm also really uh, keen on, on the 11 inch. Um, I should mention this as well. You know, there's, there's another slightly, I guess, slight variance on the design and I'm not sure what it is exactly, but that's um, some of these newer designs, like with the uh, Celestron HDs. And I'm not sure how much time you've spent with those. I, I've been fortunate to spend quite a bit of time with those HD instruments. Shane, didn't know if you had any uh, experience either. Um, yeah, yeah. The um, the C11, I think, like the Celestron 11 inch um, that I that a friend of mine had, or maybe still has. Uh, I'm pretty sure that was the HD version. And then um, another friend of ours, uh, I think he had an HD version, um, but they're they are fantastic. Um, like they, they really, uh, they're really sharp. Yeah. Yeah. Risa, she ended up, uh, when she moved here, she bought an eight inch HD. That was the first one I looked through and having looked through, um, quite a few Schmidt cast screens prior to that and been interested, like, Oh yeah, they're neat telescopes. I can sort of see their pluses and minuses. Um, I was really blown away by how good that Celestron eight inch HD was, I was like, huh. And then, uh, Stefano and how, um, they each end up yeah. getting, I think the nine and a quarters and had them out together on a few nights. And uh, so I spent a long time with the HD nine and a quarters on several nights. And, uh, I was equally, I was just like really, really blown away by the nine and a quarter. There are big instruments. I found like, Oh, this is more like observatory class gear. I'm glad it's not mine. And these people are hauling them out and I get to look through them. Um, but I was really, um, surprised. I think those ones are really like maximized for, um, like the, like the Schmidt Cassegrain design, it's, it's almost on like a different tier in a way. I was really surprised more like, I think those work more like a Mac suit off. They're like taking the best of all worlds or something. I don't know exactly what they're doing with those, but they, I think are ridiculously, uh, ridiculously good. And, um, I've often thought, huh, it would be pretty nice to have one of those nine, a quarter, or 11 inch, uh, HDs, but they are, I think they're significantly heavier than the regular Schmidt cast grains for, uh, for whatever reason that the, the fairy dust weighs uh, greatly in them. <laughs> <laughs> well, you pay for that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so yeah, I don't think I've looked through the, uh, the 11 inch though, but, uh, I imagine it's uh, equally as good. Yeah. Yeah. They, they really are quite impressive. Um, you, you can't go wrong with one of those. Yeah. So anyway, that would be, um, somebody is looking at this design and they have more of a permanent setup. I think, um, like the Celestron HD, uh, definitely is that that's the one that I've looked through the most in recent years and have been, um, blown away by, <laughs> I can't say it enough. It, they did take some time to cool down, although, um, not as long as I would have thought. I know when Stefan would bring his out, um, he'd set it up and yeah, it was like an hour or so, like, come back in an hour and a quarter kind of thing. Uh, there, there was no point looking through it much before then that it was pretty uh, bad, but he would have it like in his warm car. And then we'd be setting it up on like a zero degree evening and it had been 25 degrees that day. So that, that was the scenario sort of like worst case for cooling. Um, but yeah, once it cooled down after an hour and a quarter, like that's the telescope I was looking through that night, you know, it was all good. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. 
Yeah, good stuff. Any 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 other experiences you've had with these uh, Schmidt Cassegrain type of compound telescopes? No, not really. Like again, you know, my personal ownership experience has been quite limited. Um, but whenever I've looked through one of these, uh, I can't say I've been disappointed with the views. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe the biggest drawback is is you're not going to get a very wide field of view compared to some of the refractors out there. But yeah, um, you know, if you're a reflector guy, you know, it's sort of the same thing. So um, they certainly have a place. Uh, I may end up owning one at some point in the future. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, um, the, the aperture you get for the small form factor yeah. is very appealing to me. And, uh, perhaps one day I, like I say, I'll, I might own one. Yeah. And the one thing you can do, which, which many people do now, uh, you can get these and they've had them for a while, but I think it's really been perfected is the ability to use an, an F six or so focal reducer in there. I know some of them are six, three, some of them are six, some of them are seven. I, I, I don't know all the ins and outs of it. Um, but a lot of people basically, unless they're looking at planets, they say they have the focal reducer screwed into the back. So if you have an 11 inch telescope, it's working more like an F 6 3, which, uh, which is actually a pretty nice focal ratio. If you ask me, I like, I like F six to F eight instruments. And so, uh, otherwise these instruments all typically be in, maybe I should have said this a little bit earlier, but they all tend to be like F tens or F twelves. Um, give or take some like F-15s and some F-20s and sort of uh, like unique sort of telescope engineering or TEC company designs. Um, but for the most part, the Schmidt cast grains are F-10s. And then a lot of the uh, the Mac suit-offs uh, all seem to be F-12s. The Mac newts tend to be F-4, F-5. And then the, um, let's see, the Mac suit-off Newtonians, they tend to be in the F-5 to F-6-ish range. I think they did even make some up to F eight. Um, and they're all sort of, uh, unique and un- unto themselves. So yeah, I kind of should have put some of that stuff in earlier, but there I summarized it at the end and saved the day. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Anything else to add, Shane? No, that's it. All right. Thanks, Shane. Thanks everybody for listening. We're on Patreon. If anybody wants to send us a donation, donation, we always uh, appreciate it. Um, We love doing the show and uh, through uh, listener support, that's how we're able to do two shows a week now into our third year, which is uh, something I didn't know we'd ever see and uh, rapidly approaching our 250th episode. And uh, we're always excited to get your observing uh, emails and uh, and opinions. Maybe there's some people out there with Schmidt Cassegrains who are listening and will write us in and tell us we're good, we got it wrong and we're happy to hear you. Um, you can send those to actualastronomy at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you everyone for listening and we hope you enjoyed the show. If you are interested in more information, would like to contact us, or if you would like to support the podcast, check out our website, actualastronomy.com.